Good afternoon, everyone. Our next speaker is Professor Goland Davis, and she will be speaking to the uh, item, the United Nations, what is the legal responsibility of an intergovernmental organization? Um, I would like to invite the professor to come to the podium, please. Uh, and there's a bit of a change here. The professor will be speaking for 25 minutes, no questions. We will then have a break, and she will return then to give the second part of her presentation when she will then answer questions. It seems that there is no translation, is it true? Do you have translation? Les francophones, est-ce qu'il y a la traduction? Ah, bon, voilà. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you um, for the invitation to speak here. Uh, my testimony today will focus on the central responsibility of the United Nations for Palestine. It's going to seek to demonstrate, one, that the question of Palestine cannot be regarded as a bilateral matter left to negotiations between Israel and Palestine, but that it has a central responsibility to promote self-determination and statehood within the framework of the United Nations roadmap, which is set in place as early as 1947. Slower, okay, right. Uh, so that's the, the, the first point, is that it has a central responsibility uh, for Palestine on the basis of the UN roadmap. My secondly, my testimony will seek to underline the failure of the UN to carry out this responsibility for while the UN has established a normative framework for the treatment of the Palestinian question, and whatever one may think of that normative framework, it is there, um, and although it's condemned Israel's manifest violations of international law, it has had a very disappointing record of enforcement of this roadmap, uh, partly because of the double standards practiced in the Security Council, I think you've heard about that this morning, uh, but also to the failure of the General Assembly to assert fully its secondary responsibility in the field of peace maintenance. Thirdly, my testimony will seek to query whether such failure of the United Nations to take action uh, may in certain circumstances lead to U the UN to incur responsibility in a strict legal sense. In other words, it will address the accountability of the UN under international law. Uh, now, in this session, I'm going to trace the historical origins and the legal foundations of UN responsibility and the double standards in the Security Council. And in the second session, we'll go on to cover the other issues. Now, uh, you've all heard about the International Court of Justice this morning and its excellent wall opinion. Uh, in The Hague, handed down in 2004, almost quasi-unanimously, uh, with only one judge abstaining. Now, responding to objections that it should reject the General Assembly's request for an advisory opinion because it would be interfering in a bilateral dispute, the court said uh, that the opinion is requested on a question which is of particularly acute concern to the UN and is essential for the functions of the General Assembly. The, this responsibility has been described by the General Assembly as, and I quote, a permanent responsibility towards the question of Palestine until the question is resolved in all its aspects in a satisfactory manner in accordance with international legitimacy. The Security Council said much the same thing uh, back in 1948 in one of its first resolutions when it acted under Chapter 7 of the, of the uh, 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 charter, one forgets that it had determined at that point that Palestine, the question of Palestine was a threat to international peace and security, and it said the terms of this resolution would remain in force until a peaceful settlement of the future situation of Palestine is reached. So both organs are agreed that they are seized of this question until uh, the full realization of the rights of the Palestinian peoples. So as I've said, the question of Palestine cannot be regarded as either a bilateral, trilateral matter, or, nor is the UN an equal partner of the quartet 
as Professor Dugard uh, has underlined in much of his writings, the UN is central. So what are the origins and foundation of this responsibility? First, Palestine is of uh, UN concern because it raises issues which lie at the heart of the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Threats to the peace, right to self-determination, human rights. Second, the territory which corresponds for the UN to the territory occupied in 1967 has an internationally protected status under international law. This has been collectively recognized, including by the ICJ. And this status rests on three legal bases. One, Palestine is a former mandate, uh, and that has devolved the responsibility of the, over the mandate, the supervisory powers of the League of Nations devolved to the General Assembly. And the ICJ confirmed that in respect of another mandate, that of Namibia. Uh, secondly, Palestine is a self-determination unit because self-determination in UN jargon has to be exercised over a defined territory. And that territory, according to the United Nations, uh, corresponds to the armistice line or the 67 borders, very broadly speaking. And self-determination has all kinds of consequences. Number one, it's a, a fundamental norm of international law from which no state or international organization can derogate from. And it's the concern of all states, what we call uh, erga omnes uh, obligations. Secondly, uh, from self-determination uh, flows uh, all kinds of um, consequences, as I've said, uh, which are the, after, you know, as, uh, in addition to that question of borders, the right to representation and ultimately the right to statehood. So that's the ultimate objective. And from the right to self-determination flows the right to permanent sovereignty over natural resources and also the right to self-determination entails obligations, a right to respect for the territorial integrity and unity of the whole territory under occupation. There's no question of dismembering the territory uh, in any way. Thirdly, a third aspect of that international status is that it is occupied territory. And here again, international law regulates this. We know the application of the Fourth Geneva Conventions um, uh, and so on, but also the Security Council has laid down uh, a normative framework for occupied territory, in particular that of Palestine. It has, for example, determined uh, the illegality under international law of this occupation. It's called for withdrawal. And it has also, very importantly, declared the nullity or invalidity of all legislative and administrative measures taken by Israel, which purport to alter the character and status of the occupied territory. In other words, any unilateral action by Israel to change the character of the territory is null and void. Here is the council acting as a judicial organ, making a quasi-judicial determination. Um, for example, it declared that Israel's 1980 basic law establishing Jerusalem as the complete and united capital of Israel is null and void. Uh, and it has also uh, determined, very importantly, that Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, is established in flagrant violation of the Geneva Conventions. And the ICJ confirmed that very strongly, including the, the uh, one dissenting judge, Burgenthal, it is often forgotten, joined uh, the court in this um, pronouncement that the settlements were in fact illegal. And of course, that entails individual criminal responsibility. Now, um, the, the status of, uh, of Palestine uh, as, you know, as, as having an international status means effectively that the UN has to protect uh, that status. The court also, very importantly, uh, confirmed that the continued applicability of human rights law in the territory. It confirmed the applicability of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Committee, the Civil uh, Convention, the Civil and Political Rights Convention, uh, and so on. And this is very important because uh, one tended to presume that uh, in armed conflict, human rights was suspended. 
and the court here confirms that human rights law, unless expressly derogated from, uh, which Israel has only done with one uh, provision of the Civil and Political Rights uh, Convention, continue to apply. Now let me look at, so, so what I've been trying to do is, is trace the reason for why the UN is legally, and here I'm talking only in international law terms, why it is legally uh, responsible for the territory uh, uh, until such time as, as this is solved. I want to come now to the failure of the UN to ensure compliance. So although I've traced a complete normative framework, uh, this normative framework, as has been raised time and time again this morning, uh, has not been enforced. It was mentioned this morning that the ICJ in the Wall case called on the UN and especially the General Assembly and the Security Council to consider what further action is required to bring to an end the illegal situation of the war. But the UN has had a disappointing record of enforcing uh, this advisory opinion and of course of enforcing all of its roadmap. This is due, as I've said in particular, to the double standards, manifest double standards, practiced in the Security Council. Uh, even though uh, the Security Council has determined in other situations, in exactly the same terms as Palestine, the violations of human rights, the threats to international peace and security, and has enforced vigorously all of its other uh, resolutions in other situations. In the case of Palestine, this has been notably uh, absent. So let me give you uh, some examples and some analogies. Uh, we have also to look at this in a much broader context. We have to look at this in the light of the United Nations development, the contemporary development of the UN. We've seen that the notion of collective security has changed to include not just the security of states, but the security also of individuals. We have seen also that the UN has paid lip service in many of its territories and so that, it, uh, that it administers, uh, and on a number of occasions, the concept of rule of law in international affairs. So we have to look at what the Council has done you know, in the context of such developments. In its practice, the Council has determined that conduct in violation of norms like genocide, ethnic cleansing, and so on, and serious breaches of human rights, including the right to self-determination, and breaches of humanitarian law, constitute threats to international peace and security. It has to date uh, adopted a series of extremely vigorous measures, uh, some of which go clearly uh, beyond what was originally conceived of in, the you know, in San Francisco in 1945. It's imposed around 19 sanctions regimes spanning four continents acting under Article 41. And I won't uh, go through them, arms, uh, embargoes, targeted sanctions, and so on. The Council has established an international presence ranging from far-reaching fact-finding and monitoring systems to peacekeeping operations with extended mandates, even allowed to use force in self-defense. There are currently 16 UN peace operations deployed on four continents. Uh, in a number of situations, it has authorized member states and regional organizations to resort to all necessary measures, read the use of force including no-fly zones. But its, its resolutions have also led to institutionalizing international criminal responsibility. Who would have thought that the Council could establish the ICTY, the ICTR on Rwanda, could get into an agreement with Sierra Leone on crimes? But also, uh, and to show you the extent to which it has gone, to actually establish uh, a special tribunal on Lebanon which is supposed to uh, have jurisdiction over domestic crimes, effectively, the murder of some individuals, uh, and under Lebanese domestic law. Now, just a few examples, because I don't have time, but I could go on and on. Uh, for example, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, as you know, was met by one of the most comprehensive sanctions re regimes lasting over a decade, which crippled Iraq, effectively. Uh, it used authorized the use of force for limited purposes to protect UN so-called safe areas, 
to reinstate democratically elected regimes and so on. Compare this to the situation in Palestine, which could not more starkly be said to constitute a threat to interna sorry, international peace and security. It has imposed policies of non-recognition. What is interesting, it declared, for example, the annexation of Kuwait by Iraq under any form as null and void. But also, interestingly, it invalidated private acts of individuals. For example, in the case of Bosnia, the principle that all statements or commitments made under duress, particularly those relating to land and property, are wholly null and void. So the council has even entered the domestic sphere in invalidating uh, such um, uh, measures. And there are also examples of non-recognition of Cyprus, the Cypriot Republic, uh, of Namibia, and so on. And the court in the Namibia case has stated it would be an untenable interpretation to maintain that once the council had declared illegality, uh, those that the member states of the UN would be free to act in disregard of such illegality or even to recognize violations of law. That was the ICJ in the Namibia opinion. It has condemned ethnic cleansing in a number of situations, whether it's Iraq, Bosnia, uh, Kosovo, of course, uh, and so on, East Timor, the list goes on and on. What about the policies of Bantustanization, tantamount to ethnic cleansing that, that was raised this morning, and demographic manipulation in the occupied Palestinian territory? In the wall case, the ICJ confirmed that the construction of a wall in the OPT created a fait accompli, which if it became permanent, would be tantamount to de facto annexation. In other words, that area between the armistice line and the wall would incorporate more than 16% of the territory of the West Bank, including within that area around 80% of Israeli settlers. And the court underlined, uh, remember that what we're talking about, the occupied Palestinian territory, 22% of historic Palestine. Uh, and the court continued by saying, cutting the Palestinian territories into barely contiguous territorial units would of course threaten the potential of any future viable Palestinian state, but could generate another exodus, thus risking further alterations to the demographic composition of the occupied Palestinian territory. Not a word from the Security Council relating to the wall uh, and this Bantustanization. It has also, as I've said, the Security Council responded to breaches of international human rights and humanitarian law uh, through the uh, imposition of individual criminal responsibility. But the Council's reactions to grave breaches of humanitarian law committed against Palestinians have lacked robust enforcement. In terms of fact-finding, the Council has been unwilling to adopt fact-finding missions under Chapter 7 authority. It has shielded itself behind the UN Secretary General, merely welcoming his initiative, for example, Jenin refugee camp, and even when the Israeli IDF in Gaza caused deaths, injuries, and damage to UN property in seven incidents, it was on the initiative of the Secretary General, not of the Security Council, that a four-member board of inquiry was established. And that, I point out, was the report was never fully published. It was only an executive uh, summary. So I can go on and on, the same thing with the flotilla incident. Uh, with the Secretary General's report, uh, uh, and so on. And of course, uh, the operation cast lead. The Council prevaricated for two weeks before calling for a ceasefire, and there was no fact-finding mission. Now, the Security Council refused to discuss the Goldstone report and remained totally impervious to its recommendations. Its main recommendation was to refer the situation in Gaza to the ICC prosecutor if no credible investigations have been conducted by Israel and the Hamas administration. There was predictably no follow-up, even though the Council has powers under the ICC statute. And on, on the basis of these powers, it has referred both Libya, or sorry, both Darfur and Libya to the Security Council, uh, to the ICC, leading to the indictment uh, of individuals. I want to point out also that the Security Council has 
uh, given a central place to the problem of refugees. Uh, it has called on a number of occasions to the right of return of refugees and displaced persons, that the Dayton Accords, the, the peace process has also given a central place, that there is an Annex 7 on refugees, uh, and that under that there is the establishment uh, of a um, committee or commission uh, to look at restitution of property. In other words, there is also the question of uh, compensation uh, for property rights uh, because the owners had to flee the conflict uh, and that residents, uh, the, the, the council says, the, the, sorry, the, the, uh, it is said in a resolution on Georgia, I'm sorry, I'm skipping, uh, that individual property rights have not been affected by the fact that the owners had to flee during the conflict uh, and that residency rights and identity of those owners will be respected. So we see, again, uh, in questions of refugee issues, the difference when 194 is also considered a taboo uh, question at all. And as far as compensation is concerned, remember that Iraq had to pay $52 billion of compensation under a UN Compensation Commission, specially established, which had vast reaching uh, powers. Now, I come to uh, the conclusion of this uh, session by simply saying, uh, by, by underlining that the situation in Palestine and Israeli policies and practices may be described in similar terms to the great number of cases that I have outlined or have not outlined, which were before the Security Council. That in stark contrast, no enforcement action or other remedy was ordered by the Security Council. We've spoken today about the veto this morning. We all know why the Security Council has been unable to act. Uh, from 1983 to the present, I'm not very good on statistics, but I think that the US cast around 22 vetoes on Palestine from 83 to the present. It was alone among the permanent members. It was always the single permanent member that vetoed. And it vetoed resolutions which were where the content was accepted by the United Nations, by international law. Settlements, for example, uh, Israeli practices, uh, expropriation of land, uh, and so on and so forth. So I want to end this part by saying that the, it is this virtual immunity which Israel enjoys from the measures that are routinely applied by the Council that's had a very a damaging impact on attempts to persuade the Israeli government to engage in a true uh, peace process rather than uh, the one that we referred to this morning. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank, thank you very much, Professor, for your excellent presentation. I think it gives us all... <laughs> thank you pres for your presentation, Professor. It gives us all an insight into the fact that the United Nations can take robust action when it wants to, but when it comes to the Palestinian question, it uh, just turns the other way. And also the power of the uh, American lobby uh, and how much work we have to do. So we look forward to, after the break, to your second part of your presentation. Thank you, Professor.